The sick and insane were confined in this commonwealth in cages, closets, cellars, dolls, and pens, chained, beaten with rods, lashed into obedience. Disgusted by the inhumane treatment of the mentally ill, reformer Dorothea Dix lobbied for better treatment of these people. Dix and her colleague Thomas Story Kirkbride fought for improving treatment methods, as well as the way in which the mentally ill were viewed by society. Dix and Kirkbride's efforts to revolutionize treatment of the mentally ill led to the construction of the first Kirkbride Asylum in 1854, as well as influenced the construction of over 300 similar facilities. Dr. Thomas Story Kirkbride's reaction to the management of mentally ill patients led to eventual reforms in the treatment of these patients, as well as the living conditions in the asylums in which they were placed. Dr. Kirkbride's introduction of the Kirkbride Plan in the late 1800s revolutionized how present-day mental facilities function. Kirkbride asylums were newly established building types, which were thought to be essential for inflicting a cure for the mentally ill. Thomas Kirkbride asserted that close supervision of the mentally ill resulted in the promotion of self-control. He hoped that the patients would then, in turn, change their behaviors. More importantly, by promoting moral treatment, Dr. Kirkbride tried to re-establish the patient's dignity and self-image. Typically, the mentally ill were social outcasts. Kirkbride sought to address this perception through his newly introduced treatments. By implementing a regimented life, eating healthy foods, exercising on a daily basis, and not allowing patients to venture into cities where they were unwanted, he felt that the mentally ill would later be able to return to society without the harassment of their previous life. The Kirkbride plan not only promoted moral treatment of patients, but the building design was also created with curing patients in mind. When Dr. Thomas Kirkbride drew up the floor plans to these buildings, the intricate designs reflected his desire to help these patients. The Kirkbride buildings had different sections, each for a specific purpose, connected through the known hallways as well as the underground system of tunnels. These different methods of connection were used to ensure that patients were less likely to escape from the premises, as well as guarantee that higher administration was always able to access the patients. The wings of the main administration building contained the patient wards. Dr. Kirkbride segregated the patients by gender in hopes that interaction with only people of the same sex would increase the likelihood of healing. Additionally, the most extreme, violent, delusional, and dangerous patients were held at the very back of the ward, furthest from the exit, due to the fact that there were less chance of them ever leaving the institution. Although there was a very small chance of these extreme patients ever leaving the facility, Dr. Kirkbride instituted the concept of a merit system to encourage patients to heal and progressively move closer to the front of the building. In Dr. Kirkbride's eyes, everything was essential to the patient's well-being. Because of the shifting perspective and the fundamental changes resulting from the introduction of the Kirkbride plan, treatment for the mentally ill patients was revolutionized. The design of the Kirkbride institution were made catering to the needs of patients. The buildings were designed in a V shape with administration as the center point. This allowed for wings to stretch off the main building the design segregated patients by gender, as well as by the different type of illnesses that included attention deficit disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, eating disorder, anxiety, schizophrenia, paranoia, psychosis, and panic disorder. The placement of the patients was dependent upon the severity of their disease. Additionally, the shape of the building promoted a merit system to encourage the ill to become better and continually improve so they could eventually move closer to the front of front where the exit was located. Furthermore, the buildings were developed on rolling land to allow farming as well as separation from the citizens who looked upon the mental patients as menaces of society. His very precise plan specified the materials the building should be built from the amount of land surrounding the building, the size and height of ceilings, doorways, and windows, the stairways, as well as minuscule details such as ventilation and doorknobs. These details, and many more, 
all had a very exact purpose, including the initiative of healing these patients. The institutions that were built following the Kirkbride plan, including these instructions, had to live up to very high standards that Dr. Kirkbride set in order to benefit the patient's every need. The opportunity for patients to cultivate the land allowed for residents to harvest their own food and crops through a garden and farm-like atmosphere. This helped develop real-life skills. To change society's views on the hospitalized patients, Kirkbride encouraged the patients to restore their health so they could once again live in everyday society. Due to Dr. Thomas Kirkbride's concern for the mentally ill, these reactions proposed solutions to the problems the mentally ill faced. In addition to the architectural changes that were made, the Kirkbride plan introduced new treatments for the mentally ill. Formerly, mentally ill people were confined and hidden within basements. They were locked away from society in prisons and warehouses, where they were beaten into obedience because it was unknown how to handle these types of people. With the newly varied treatment options introduced, controlling the patients was made easier. However, the most common treatments were very harsh and are now seen as inhumane. One of these frequently practiced treatment methods was the use of the straitjacket. This was used as a form of restraint and tied back the patient's arms so they were completely unable to move until they quieted down. The use of electroshock therapy was also common. Electroshock therapy, also known as EST, was used to erase a patient's mind, thus ridding them from the evil which was thought to be inside of their mind. To do this, a strong electrical current was sent through the skull to induce seizures in hopes of improving the patient's health. This was done by administering shocks to patients submerged in water or directly to the temples from electrodes. Another one of the harshest methods of treatment was the infamous lobotomy, also known as psychosurgery. This form of surgery used an implement which was inserted into the frontal lobe of the brain through the eye socket in order to make the patient less violent and less disturbed. Usually three successive convulsions are necessary, but in old people a single one may be sufficient, while in a sturdy young person four or even six convulsions may be administered without danger. Turning now to the operation itself, very little preparation is necessary for transorbital lobotomy. The instrument was put in above the eyeball and in the plane of the nose. However, most often the patients went into a vegetative state or died when this barbaric operation was performed. As time progressed and these methods showed little positive response, it was realized how inhumane they were. In order to keep healing these patients, Dr. Kirkbride's colleagues followed in his footsteps and further altered treatment methods. These newly evolved methods, group therapy, talking therapy, drug therapy, and vitamin therapy are still practiced in present day time due to the fact that they are much more humane. The advancements that Dr. Kirkbride initiated soon changed the outlook and views of mentally ill patients. The therapies and cures that evolved from this plan have become widely practiced and looked upon in a more positive manner. Because of Dr. Thomas Stoy Kirkbride's reaction to help revolutionize the treatment of the mentally ill, he successfully reformed not only the matter in which these people were looked upon, but he reinstituted their sense of self-worth.